Welcome back to the Great Books Quest. This is Plutarch's Lives, Life of Caesar, Life of Julius Caesar. So, we start off with Caesar as a boy, rather as a young man, and there are two competing factions. There's Marius and Sulla, both commanders, both statesmen, both generals, but they're rivals. And right now, Sulla is in power, which means Marius is not in power, which means Marius is in a low state. Caesar, Marius is Caesar's father's sister's husband, making him his uncle. So Sulla does not like Caesar already because of the family relation, and he wants to put him to death. And Caesar is actually captured by Sulla's men, but he bribes Cornelius, the leader of the men, with two talents to set him free. Two talents, one talent being around $4,000. So it's a, quite a significant sum of money. And while he's sailing back, he gets captured by pirates. Caesar gets captured by pirates. Cilicians, most murderous of men. And Caesar... First of all, the ransom is set at 20 talents. He laughs at them in, as not knowing who their captive is and says, set the ransom to 50 talents. So he hires his own ransom. When he wants to sleep, he sends for them to stop talking. He participates in their games and exercises with great unconcern. He writes poetry and speeches, and anybody that doesn't understand it or doesn't admire it he calls to their faces illiterate barbarians. So these men are like his royal bodyguard rather than his captors. And the ransom eventually comes and he is set free. But what he does is he sets sail and captures the pirates. He captures most of them, gets them into his possession, and gets them put into prison. But then he later takes them out of prison and crucifies them. Such is the character of Caesar. Now he sails to Rhodes to study rhetoric and study oratory with Apollonius, the son of Molon, who's a famed rhetorician, a famed teacher, who's actually Cicero is one of his students. So this is a big time teacher. Caesar is excellent at oratory but he never achieves number one rank that he's because he devotes his efforts to being a statesman and a military commander. Now, Caesar is in Rome, and what does he do but accumulate influence? He does this by setting up gladiatorial games, banquets, feasts. He has actually 1,300 talents in debt before he holds any public office. That's a lot of debt. There's actually one office open. The high priest died, so that leaves a, can the, leaves a vacancy for Pontifex Maximus, or high priest. And Caesar decides that he's gonna run for the high priest's office. Catalyst, one of the candidates for high priest, actually tries to bribe Caesar with a large sum of money to desist the contest. And Caesar says, no, I will continue the contest even if I have to borrow a larger sum of money than that to continue. So that's what happens. And Caesar, on the day of the election, his mother sees him at the door. She's in tears, and he kisses her, and he says, Mother, today she'll see me either high priest or in exile. So a lot of pressure on this. And the vote is taken and it's a sharp contest, but Caesar wins, Caesar prevails. He wins the office of high priest. That leaves the nobility wondering if there's going to be all types of chaos now that Caesar is in the high priest's office, but that's not the case. Now, there's an incident in Caesar's family 
with his wife and a man named Claudius. A man named Claudius, there's a festival going on, a festival of the goddess, and it's a women's festival only. No men allowed. No men allowed. And at this festival, Claudius shows up as a man. He knows he shouldn't do it, but he does it. He tries to set up an interview with Pompeia, the wife of Caesar. Not good. He goes into the house. He gets caught by one of the women there. They go out into the night and tell their husbands what happened. Claudius is charged, but he gets acquitted. Caesar divorces his wife and says, he doesn't know what's going on with Claudius, but he does, he does not wish his wife to be under any suspicion whatsoever. So he divorces his wife right then and there. Now Caesar is given the province of Spain. Before he can go to Spain, he has to make recourse to Crassus, the richest man, and get 830 talents in debt, out of debt rather, 830 talents, before he can go to his province of Spain. While he's on the way, they pass by a village in the Alps, which was a very poor site, and they ask, his friends ask him, can there be here mutual jealousies of powerful men and struggles for office, like in Rome? And Caesar says, for my part, I'd rather be first here than second at Rome. He's also reading, when he's in Spain, he was also reading from his leisure, a book of Alexander the Great history. And he breaks down into tears and cries and says, is it not matter for sorrow that while at my age Alexander was king of already so many peoples and I have yet achieved no brilliant, brilliant successes? So that's who he's comparing himself to, Alexander the Great. Now, Caesar is running for consulship. Consul being similar to the office of president. There are, although there are two consuls, not one, two consuls. Caesar runs for the office of consul, and he wins. And when he wins this office of the consulship, he proposes laws that are like a radical tribune, a tribune being a representative of the people. He sets up laws for the distribution of land, and he he gets Pompey and Crassus, he reconciles them and creates a triumvirate between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, three of the most powerful men in Rome. And he's protected by the friendship of Crassus and Pompey during his consulship, and he asks them if they approve of his laws, and they say that he, they do approve of his laws. And then he asks them, to come up against the laws, to come, against, to come up against the people that are opposing him with swords. So Pompey brings armed men into the forum, and this prevents a lot of the senators from, from being there. They're, they'd leave out of fear of the armed men that Pompey brings. So that's, in a nutshell, Caesar's consulship. It's all about the people, satisfying the people, not satisfying the nobility or the other senators. So he's very controversial like that. Now, we enter a new stage of life for Caesar, and that is the Gallic Wars the Gallic Wars. And Caesar is inferior to no commander whatsoever that was before him. One, because of the 
difficult uh, terrain that he had to fight his war on. Another because of the difficult, savage manners and dispositions of the men he has to fight against. Another of the, the regions in which he waged his warfare. So there's a lot of hard work. Another in the, in the amount of enemies that he had subdued. For he fought three million men, killed one million, and took another million prisoner in the course of ten years of the Gallic Wars. Killed one million men. That's a lot of kill, killed people. So we start with the first battle, and it's against the Helvetii and the Tigurini. The Tigurini are routed by Labienus, his deputy, but the Helvetii meet him at their own march. And he fights a decisive battle with them, and he prevails, but not, not before being given a bunch of trouble at their wagons. For at the wagons, not only did the men fight, but their children and wives fought, fought with them to, and were cut down to death. They were cut down to death along with the men. The Helvetii had burned down their villages and Caesar compelled them to re-inhabit the villages that they burned down. For he thought that if they left them vacant, the Germans would occupy it. The next war he fought was against the Germans and Ariovistus, who was their king. And the Germans had holy women who gave prophecies. And the prophecy was not to battle before a new moon that gave its light. And Caesar heard about this and obviously wanted to fight before the new moon. So he incited them to, he incited them in anger, attacked them, and forced them to fight it out. And obviously they were routed. Self-fulfilling prophecy, perhaps, perhaps not, perhaps a good prophecy. But the dead were said to be 80,000 in number. Now the Belgae revolted. Caesar had to quell their rebellion. And he had to fight against the Nervi. And the Nervi were exceptionally strong. They surrounded his men with 60,000 of their forces, 60,000 men. And they slew the centurions of the 7th and 12th legions. And Caesar had to dash into their midst with his shield. And the 10th legion, after seeing what trouble Caesar was in, came down and fought it out and cut them down. But it was a very tough battle, and they came out with a lot of casualties on both sides. Now, Caesar also was the first to cross the Atlantic Ocean with an army to wage war in Britannia, the island of Britain. He waged war with them, but they were in poverty, and he didn't like it. So he just imposed tributes, took some hostages from the king, and sailed away. But he, was, he carried an army across the ocean to wage war, and that was a significant accomplishment in and of itself. Now... There was rebellion being fomented, a big rebellion taking place among all the among all Gaul. The seeds of war were being sown. And Vercingetorix was the leader of this rebellion. He organized it so that they all rebelled under his command. 
and that gave Caesar no end of trouble. For at Elysia, they fought a decisive battle, and there were 300,000 men who came in to, to support the force of 170,000 fighting men. So you do the math, that's 470,000 men that Caesar is fighting against. He has to build two walls for his protection, one against the city and one against the supporters who are coming in to help out. He's in big trouble, but somehow he manages to defeat the forces. I don't know how he did it. I've read about it. This battle beats me. It just, he just won. And the forces dispersed like a phantom in the night. And Vercingetorix rode up on his horse, got off of his horse, and surrendered to Caesar. And that's the Battle of Elysia, and how this revolt was put down by Caesar. Now Caesar and Pompey had to fight it out, because Crassus had died. So now it was just Caesar and Pompey left. Pompey demanded his forces back. So Caesar gave his forces back. He had lent him legions to fight the Gallic Wars. And now he demanded them back. Now in the Senate, there was a lot of controversy going on because who knows what Caesar was going to do. There was, first of all, Caesar first wanted to disband his army if Pompey disbanded his army as well. Let them both become private citizens. But the Senate wouldn't allow this. They would not allow Pompey to disband his army. Then later Caesar had some reasonable accommodations, such as a couple of legions and a couple of regions that are left for him. It was a reasonable proposal, but Lentulus, one of the senators who hated Caesar, would not allow it. He wanted all or nothing. He wanted Caesar to surrender completely. And that was not going to happen. So Caesar gets his forces together, a small amount of forces, about 300 horsemen, 5,000 legionaries, to take the city of Ariminum. And he himself was at the banquet hall, and after he had bid his guests farewell, he rode up to the river Rubicon. But then he checked his speed and he deliberated back and forth about the resolution that he was about to take on. Because you cross the Rubicon with an army, you are declaring civil war and you're an enemy to Rome. So does he want to do this or not? After much deliberation, he finally plunges forward, uttering those desperate words, let the die be cast. Let the die be cast. And after he sees Ariminum, war breaks out in Italy. There's pa pandemonium everywhere. Riots. People are going crazy. People are scared. People are going out of their wits, at their wits end. Pompey actually declares a state of anarchy and commands the senators to leave, to abandon Rome. And they do. And they take their possessions as if they're robbing other people. They take their own possessions. 
and they leave. Caesar, after 60 days, becomes master of Rome. All he has to do is cross the Rubicon. And he comes into Rome and he finds there's still some senators there and they're very quiet and calm and everything is everything is peaceful and calm when he's there and he's in the Senate and he's trying to open the treasury so he can get money from there and there's a senator named Metellus who is opposing him and telling him not to do it and Caesar says war and free speech has no free speech has no space in this war and the law does not apply here when when war is when the war is over then you can come before your people before the people with your harangues and he says something to this nature and Metellus and after he sends smiths to break open the lock on the treasury door. Metellus continues to oppose him and he threatens to kill him. And he says, Thou knowest, young man, that truly it is more difficult for me to say this than it is for me to do it. And after that, Metellus goes away in a complete fright after his life being threatened. And then Caesar is able to get the money and all the money that he needs is furnished to him for the war. Now, Caesar gets the best of Pompey in all the battles except for one in Dur Duracium, where all of Caesar's dead are falling, men are, his men are being slain. There's commotion, pandemonium. He, even he is almost slain. Even he is almost slain in this battle. He even says after Pompey withdraws. He says victory today had been with it with Pompey if he had, if he had a victor in command. The victory, to, the victory today had been with the enemy if they had a victor in command. But Pompey did not pursue. Pompey didn't even want to fight. He was goaded on by his generals, by his senators. They were all telling him, they were calling him Agamemnon and King of Kings and teasing him and making fun of him. And he wasn't strong enough to stand up to the pressure, so he reluctantly pursued Caesar. And that set up this final showdown at Pharsalus. Now at Pharsalus, Caesar was encamped, and Caesar sacrificed, and there was a seer. And the seer told him that there would be a great change in fortune. So if you are in a bad state, expect your fortune to be good and if you're in a good state expect your fortune to be bad now on the other side we have Pompey and his forces well they are sending agents to Rome to buy houses suitable for praetors and consuls because that's what they expected to to hold offices of praetors and consuls after the war was over that's how confident they were their horsemen were 7,000 in number compared to 1,000 in Caesar's camp. And their infantry were 45,000 compared to 22,000 in Caesar's camp. So Caesar was outnumbered. Now, Caesar fought, would fight on the right wing. So Pompey on the, his left wing to attack Caesar's right put a huge amount of horsemen to lead the charge and he thought that no matter what happened if you have this massive charge of horsemen 
that would surround the enemy and that would crush the enemy. Caesar knew this, so he ordered six cohorts to attack and he instructed them specifically what to do in order when, when they attack the horsemen. So the battle starts and the horsemen are deployed and the cohorts, they start, they, sh they stab their javelins up toward the faces of the men on the horses, the faces and the eyes. And the horsemen turn away. They can't bear the look of the wound. They can't bear the look of the javelin. So they turn away and that is not good for them because they can throw themselves in confusion and they flee from the battle. Pompey sees this and basically gives up. He goes to his tent and he just sits down there and awaits what is to come. And the battle comes to him and he says, what even to my quarters? And such is the battle. Caesar wins. Caesar wins. Now Pompey runs away to Egypt where he is murdered. Caesar follows him there and he finds an adventure awaiting him in Egypt as well. Because in Egypt he has the eunuch Pythinus to deal with. And Pythinus is very ins an insulting character. He feeds Caesar's men the worst grain available and bades them to put up with it because they're being fed by another. He uses wooden and earthen dishes instead of gold and silverware on the excuse that Caesar took all the gold and silverware in payment of a debt because the king owed Caesar 17,500,000 drachmas of which 10 million Caesar demanded payment of now. Now, Caesar was in trouble because as Cleopatra and her brother are being reconciled, Caesar reconciled them, they're celebrating it, they're celebrating it in the feast banquet hall. Caesar's barber tells him that Pothinus and Achilles Achilles the general, are plotting against him. So he sets a guard in the banqueting hall and he puts Pothinus to death. But Achilles escapes and raises a war against Caesar that's quite difficult for him. Because number one, the canals are dammed up by the enemy. There's no water for Caesar and his men. Number two, Caesar had to repel... He had to repel the his ships with fire. He had to destroy his own ships. So when he burns it with fire, it spread and it burned down the Library of Alexandria. Now this destruction can only have been partial, not a full destruction of the library, according to some sources that would have you believe that. No, it was, it was partial destruction. But nonetheless, still, still grievous. Now, Caesar was in a boat and he went to the aid of his friends in the battle and his boat was sunk, his boat was sunk and he had to swim in the water and he had papers in his hand and he, had, he was holding papers above water with one hand and he swam with the other, making it through, even though missiles were flying at him. He still managed to make it through. And he ended up winning the war against the king. So now we have Pharnaces, Pharnaces, who's conquered a couple of nations, and now he's rousing the princes to revolt in Lesser Armenia where he's planning to conquer there. And Caesar 
can't take this Caesar, immediately sets, sets sail against him with a few of his legions. And he conquers him swiftly. So swiftly, in fact, that he writes to his friend Amantius in Rome, Vini, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. A very famous phrase written by Caesar. Now, Cato and Scipio had fled after Pharsalus to Africa, where Caesar followed them there. And now he's in Africa. And there's an ancient omen that is the prerogative of the family of the Scipios to win. So Caesar had a man in his army named Scipio Salustio, and he put him at the forefront of his army as if he's the leader. And he fights that way. Is this, did, did he truly believe in this omen and did he really want to win, win this over? Perhaps. But perhaps he did it just to make fun of the enemy. We don't know. We just know that it happened. But in this battle, Caesar prevailed again. And Cato actually killed himself. Cato was a man who was opposing Caesar at every turn. But he was a very wise man. He saw through Caesar's machinations. But he did kill himself. And Caesar begrudged him his death. Caesar wanted to preserve his life. And it wasn't, it wasn't good for Caesar. Cicero had written an encomium upon Cato, entitled Cato, a book about him and his virtues. And Caesar was annoyed at this and thought that the praise of Cato was an insult, a direct insult to Caesar, a direct contradiction of Caesar. So Caesar wrote a book called Anti-Cato, where he brought together a bunch of charges against Cato. And this was after his death. So Caesar was angry with Cato for killing himself. Now Caesar is in Rome and he has to fight another battle. This battle is in Spain against the sons of Pompey who showed themselves to be great leaders but not great enough to defeat Caesar. Caesar defeats them after very hard battle and he said Caesar said that for the first time I was fighting for my life rather than for victory so that's how difficult it was for Caesar but he wins the battle and he celebrates a triumph for it and this vexes the Romans like nothing else because he's not celebrating the defeat of a foreign power but he's celebrating the defeat of one of the mightiest families of the men of the men in Rome Pompey the Great and his sons. This is not right. So Caesar incurs a little bit of hatred for that. But now he's at home in Rome and the wars are over. So now he's preparing more expeditions. He is preparing to invade Parthia and Scythia and Germany and to make his empire border on all sides by the ocean. This is, in long, this is his long-term plan. Of course he didn't get to it. But he also, he also fixed the calendar because the calendar was every so often because it was the lunar calendar and the solar year was different than the lunar year, every so often the gradual festivals would shift to the other side of the year. 
and this was not good. So Caesar studied with the great philo with philosophers and scientists and mathematicians, and put together his own calendar, one that is was rather accurate in terms of the solar year and the lunar year. So that was a big accomplishment of Caesar. Now, Caesar was wanting to be king, and this vexed the people, obviously, because Rome was not set up for kingship. Rome was set up for consuls. But Caesar was dictator for life at this point. And there was an incident where he was seated on his throne, so to speak. And the senators and consuls came to him and he did not rise up to receive them. He rather sat down. And this was a great insult to them. So they went home. And Caesar was dejected. Caesar was dejected. He put out his throat and he said that he was ready to offer it to anyone who was willing to kill him. He was very upset. There was also a festival of Lupercalia where men run around naked, I suppose, in the streets and they have shaggy thongs that they hit women's hands with in a belief that it would make them pregnant, make them more fertile. It's an ancient tradition of a festival. And Antony was one of the runners, Mark Antony. And he presented a diadem to Caesar and, and there was a slight applause when Caesar put it on. But when he rejected the diadem, the whole crowd went crazy and with applause. And again, Antony offers him the diadem. Caesar rejects it. The crowd goes wild. So this experiment failed. Caesar wasn't able to put on the diadem. But he, but there were two tribunes, and they saw that the pictures of Caesar had diadems on them, and they took them off. And Caesar was dejected by this, and he deprived them of their tribuneship, and he called them brutes and Chimeans, which means stupid, stupid people. So he was, he was not in a good state. This brings us to the final act of Caesar's life. And this is the Ides of March. Now the Ides of March is March 15th, Ides being 15th, where Caesar saw a seer and he jested with him well, the, the Ides of March are come, and the seer said, Ah, they are come, but they are not yet gone, because the seer predicted something bad would happen to Caesar on that day. And the day before, he was signing letters, and the conversation at dinner came to what kind of death is best, and he shouted out, That which is least expected, that which is unexpected. His wife had a dream that she saw him dead and was bewailing him in her arms. And she was in a great distress and, and begged him, pleaded with him to dismiss the Senate, to not go that day. And Caesar was listening to her because this, is, this was very unusual behavior for her. She was not superstitious. He 
resolved to send, he resolved to check out the omens with the seers, and the seers confirmed with him that the omens were not good that day. So he resolved to dismiss the Senate. But at this moment, Brutus Albinus, one of Caesar's close, close friends, came to the door and said to him, well, what are they going to think of you if you dismiss the Senate by chance of your wife having bad dreams? How are you going to say that this is not tyranny? And among other arguments of that sort, he persuaded Caesar to come with him to the Senate. And as Caesar was going to the Senate, we have a man who brought him a role, an important role with information that was pertinent to him. And he said, Caesar, take this and read it quickly. It is very relevant to you. And Caesar took it and tried to read it many times, but he was crowded away along, along the route by people who were getting his attention. So he passed into the Senate, and as he is sitting there and they're bringing, it through, they're bringing a petition to the forefront, and he gets angry because they keep pleading with him about the petition, Tullius raises his toga from his neck, and that's a sign for the assault to begin. Casca gives him a blow to the neck, not a mortal wound, not a deep one, but Caesar grabs the knife and says, Accursed Casca, what dost thou? And Casca says, Brother, help. And that's when it begins. That's when the conspirators all surround Caesar with their daggers. And each one has to have a blow at Caesar. And that is how Caesar dies. Every senator has to have him, has to strike Caesar with a dagger. And he was darting in this way and that and avoiding it. When he saw Brutus, when he saw Brutus with a dagger, he basically gave up. Because Brutus was a close, close friend of his. Now Brutus and company, after they had killed Caesar, went out to the Senate with glad faces full of confidence, as if they were welcoming everybody into a free world, a new free world. But the next day, when Caesar's body was carried into the forum, and Caesar's will was opened, and it was discovered that he left a large gift to all the Romans, to all Roman citizens. They couldn't take it. They burned his body, and they got flames, and went to, in, intending to burn down the houses of the murderers, but they couldn't find them. They were all well barricaded. This was the life of Caesar. He was 56 years old when he died. He survived Pompey about four years. And there was a great comet that was seen for seven days after his death. The sun that year did not rise well. It was a cold atmosphere and the fruits shriveled up. And Brutus well, Brutus was fighting a battle, and while he was fighting a battle at night, a phantom visited him, and the phantom said, I am thy evil genius, Brutus, and you shall see me at Philippi. And Brutus said courageously, Well, I shall see thee then. And after fighting a battle, Brutus saw the phantom again the second night, fought another battle courageously, but did not die in the battle but he retired to a crest of ground and drove the blow home into his own body. And such is how Brutus died. 
And this is where we leave off the life of Caesar. Thanks for watching. Take care.